Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our first Patreon goal is 100 Patreon subscribers. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait. For more information on our Patreon, please go check it out in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. How is everyone doing tonight? Welcome back to Monday Night Live. We are finally in the spooky season, October 16th. The fall bite is upon us. I just actually pre-recorded an episode with Jeff Green of Shallow Water Fishing Adventures, and we were talking about the Upper Potomac, uh, and he was talking about how the bite is absolutely on fire. That episode is going to be dropping this week as well. We're going to be talking about um, really netting honestly we got into it's so what i love about this format is when we get on little tangents and we talked about just the proper way of netting fish and how important is especially in current because you just don't think about that when you have a friend in the boat that if you have hard current blowing you really got to think about where you're gonna place that net because if if he's down creek if he's down river of you and you're pulling that thing up the net's gonna blow down and if you're having trouble hook baits that's just that's that's a no-go situation there uh so we got a lot of fun things in store and then again this is a big prize giveaway show this is how it's gonna work I have a stack of gift cards at Jake's Bait and Tackle. You ask questions that I think are really good, funny, can't be too smutty for Jake. I don't think he wants that. If he does, I guess we could we could answer that too. I don't really care. Uh, the best comments are going to win a gift card at Jake's Bait and Tackle. So I got about eight to ten of them here that we're going to be giving them away. Uh, the other thing is I just gave away a $10 gift card to my Patreon member of the, of the day, Daniel. He won for this week. Every week, I'm going to give away a gift card to a Patreon member. If you are not yet a Patreon member, please go over there and support me. I'd really appreciate it as we get to our goal of starting our own nonprofit so we can start actually stocking some of our local bodies of water. That's our overall goal. Hopefully, we get that here. But you're done with all that crap. No one cares about that. We what we care about is fishing, how to fish better, and the Susquehanna River. The Susquehanna River had a big old tournament a couple weeks ago. It feels like yesterday it happened. Josh of Smalley Talk actually won that thing with 194 inches. Uh, the guy that I'm having on next basically cashes a check every time that there's a tournament here. He did extremely well by winning the PA Bass Nation MAKBF. That's a mouthful of acronyms back in the summer. Uh, and he cracked a top five by getting a fourth place here. So without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Jake is in the house. How you doing tonight, Jake? I'm doing great. Can I can I just lead in with there is nothing too smutty for me, question wise. So whatever your viewers want to ask. YouTube is really gonna enjoy that one. Thank God. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um can we, dude, start, can we start with an unboxing, Thomas? Yeah, we can start with unboxing. Go for it. Ooh, I've been waiting for you to come back to to <laughs> oh what'd you get Ooh. Ooh. Oh, get out of the box. In the box. So exciting. I'm so excited. Look at this. It is his monthly subscription of medicinal marijuana. <laughs> no, it's a Bates Hunter. Oh, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Oh, wow. Oh, it always happens. These, reel. these reels are so awesome, dude. They're oh so hard goodness. to get out of the box, though. Anyway, kid, continue. I'm just, I'm over here, I'm over here having like a good old time with this. When did you? Wh- wh- where did you get that from? Um, so this just came in the mail. I pre-ordered a bunch of them, um, and uh, they found the pre-orders finally came in. I got four more of them sitting here beside me, and I'm waiting on one more eight speed to come. Oof. How important is is gear ratio in your opinion for different things? Because it's going up to like a thousand. It's insane, like how they keep. Because you need new equipment. You can't just have I, the same shit every month. So I don't think that, that that you can get a gear ratio fast enough for the Susquehanna. Hmm. The slowest gear. So I have one slow gear ratio reel. It's a it's a six speed that I use for cranking, um, and everything else is either seven or eight. There's a lot of eights Um, because whenever I'm reeling down current, I got to keep up with the current. And a lot of these fish, it doesn't matter how fast you reel it, they'll eat it. So that's it's so that's so interesting to me about the speed, because I think a lot of people 
do not appreciate how fast you can actually burn a bait. Now you see that on blueback lakes and things like that. There's really yeah. niche kind of things where, yeah, you can just crank that thing and catch them. But is is the Susky so unique? Because you look at people in the top 10 of any tournament, and we talked about this last time. I think you talked about this with Chris Gorsuch too, how glide baits and big swim baits play on the Susky. Is that just because there's such a presence of big bait, big bait forge? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's big bait fish here, which, you know, you obviously need if you're going to be throwing a bait like that. You know what I mean? But there's a there's a lot of big bait fish here, but I think it it – the bigger bait really just kind of triggers that primal instinct of the bigger fish. You know, um, that's what I, I think, especially now, like this time of year, they're eating, they're eating large, mm -hmm. they're eating big stuff. I mean, that no, makes sense, especially with the full moon and everything. Like I, I, that's what's so fascinating to me is how much power techniques play on the Susquehanna. I, I, I had one of our local sticks on uh, last Monday and he talked about how, yeah, he just used a swim jig and chatterbait. And it's funny because if, if you go to the Shenandoah or the Potomac or some of these like little, like the upper James, you really, every now and then you can get away with throwing big stuff, but it's, it's the tubes and the Ned rigs. It, it's a uh, Helgramite, it's your classic baits, but the right. Susky, it's where you can be a Southern boy, come up here with your power stuff and you can still get right in a hurry. And mm -hmm. because so many people are coming to the Susquehanna, is it, is it become, is it, is it losing its home field advantage, so to speak, to an extent where you have people that can come out of town and win because you have five tournaments there every year, big ones? I don't think so. Um, I think that there, you know, you have some, some very high quality river anglers. Um, but I don't think there's a, you cannot you cannot get rid of the fact that I have access to this river all the time you know, oh, yeah, prior, yeah. prior to the off limits period, you know, um, you know, there now with that being said, like you have some very good outside anglers coming in here and, you know, for instance, with Christine and I, you know, the spot that I was fishing, I fished before it's a good spot. Um, and it's kind of a little hidey hole. Like you really have to go out of your way to get to it, you know, to, to float through it. It's not somewhere where you would typically do a float through. So you really would have to explore to find it. Um, but, you know, she found it. Somebody else found it. A couple other people knew about it. Locals, you know, knew about it. So, I mean, I guess you could kind of say it's losing a little bit of home field advantage, but only with the really, really high quality anglers. Um, I, you know, it's still, it's still a learning curve to come here and fish because most people don't think that they need to work a bait as fast as you need to work a bait here yeah and guy in the comment section just i'm going to hedge off what, what i meant by that it was if you look at when they started to go to st lawrence in the first few years it was pretty much the top 20 were all northern anglers and then in recent years because they've gone there for every year you see more southern anglers granted the top five are still the canadians the northerns but you see more southern anglers catching on now because they keep going there consistently right um and, and so because you're right like if, if you live on the place like you do you're always going to be in contention but i didn't know if, if you were saying, like, there was more out of towners starting to actually hold their own now compared to years past i mean that's how i was getting at i get i guess you could say that yeah sure but i mean i think if you're a good or, you know, that translates to, to many other places, you know, cause if you know how to fish current, you kind of have a home field advantage anywhere where there's current, but if you're not, you know, if you're someone who doesn't fish current, you know, I, I guess, I don't know. I don't know if I'm answering your question, honestly. No, 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 no you are, you are. Cause I, I mean, again, I like to ask the same question to multiple people because it's like looking at a patent. Everyone has their own interpretation of it, and that's fascinating to me. Uh, when you looked at this tournament here, Susky's such a big damn place. How the hell did you break this place down? My, my last guy I had on, he just rolled out of bed inside to fish it. I'm assuming you didn't do that. <laughs> uh, not this time. Uh, I did do that with the native event. Um, whenever I, when I, with the PA Bass Nation, I just kind of woke up and decided I'm going to go there. Um, but the nice thing about this river is that any launch that you go to, there's winning fish at. And I would be confident in saying that about any single launch on this river that you went to, you could find winning fish. Um, 95 plus inches a day is what it takes to win a tournament here, but it literally could be done anywhere in the, in the inbounds period or inbounds area. Um, for me, I focused, I focused on, on areas where I knew that there would be so there was one area and it, and it was a culvert that had a wolf pack of fish that i found in practice 
And I kind of wanted to start on that wolf pack of fish because I figured I could catch three, four, maybe a whole limit there quick and, and then go about my day. <clears throat> the water had dirtied up quite a bit, so it didn't really work out that way. But, um, you know, I found that and then I kind of figured that they would be on the front sides of islands, especially with a little bit of increased current that we were expecting. And another big player is they were lowering the dam up in Sunbury, the inflatable dam. So I knew that that was going to increase the current and make it rise a little bit as well. Mm. Um, so I wanted to find an area that had a large number of grass or of just islands in general. Um, and that way it's a, you know, target rich environment and I could bounce around and, and fish that stuff. Cause I figured that they would be, they would, you know, get hug into those islands and get either on the front side or back side of them. Um, given the, you know, the time of the year. So I just kind of, I didn't really think ledges were going to play a huge deal just because ledges is, it's kind of, I mean, it's, you, you can catch them there in the summer, summer or in the fall time, but I, it's, I feel like ledges are much, much more of like a summertime thing where they get into those ledges in that fast water and shallow and just eat every top water bait that comes by. Um, but yeah, for this, I wanted to find a lot of islands and I, that's why I focused where I focused at. You said a wolf pack and it's a two day event. So unless this was like a wolf pack of like 30 or, or like, did you think this is going to tide me over for two days or was it just to get rich on the first day and then figure it out day two? No, there was so many. <laughs> uh, I pulled into this spot and I cast it at a lay down and I had probably 20, 21 inch fish come out and hit a spinner bait and he didn't get it. He just hit the blades and I didn't get the hook set on him. Um, Right after that, I – sorry about the helicopter. Right after that, um, I came up to this this little area where it was a little bit of a deeper trench. that had some, you know, some vertical, vertical structure alongside of it, and I cast it in, got bit on my first cast, saw a couple fish with that one that were just as big. That was a 19-plus inch fish. Threw it back, threw back in there, hooked up on the very next cast, 19 plus inch fish, got it all the way back to the boat. It had three or four fish with it. They were about the same size. Uh, when it jumped beside the kayak, the spinner bait fell back into the water and one of the other fish came up and ate it. Damn. So I was like, all right, these fish are, these fish are, I'm going to leave these fish alone. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And then I got, I got a, a text message on Friday and was like, hey, uh, you got somebody else over there fishing your hole because somebody knew where I was going to be starting at. And I asked him to stay off of it because I knew he was fishing that area. And I was like, hey, man, I was like, you mind staying off of this? This is where I plan on starting. And he's like, sure, yeah, I'll stay off of it. He's like, I don't want to do that anyway. And I'm like, all right, cool. So uh, while he was there, he's like, hey, uh, just to let you know, Christine is, uh, is over there in your spot. And I texted Christine Fisher and I was like, hey, I was like, get out of my hole. And she's like, what? <laughs> She's like, what are you talking about? I was like, I see where you're at. And then I, I mentioned the structure that she was fishing. And she's like, how do you know where I'm at? I was like, my trail camera caught you. Like, you don't really have a trail camera, do you? And I'm like, yeah, I do. She's like, no way. And then she sent me a picture of a 21 that she just caught out of that hole. And I was like, listen, I was like, this is where I plan on fishing tomorrow. So you either better burn it down right now or we're going to have to work something out. Because if you're coming back there tomorrow, we are gonna, we're going to be there together. And we ended up communicating it and working it out where it wasn't fair for one of us to start on it because we both had found it legitimately. So it wasn't fair for one of us to start on it and the other have to come back and hit it later. So our goal literally was to start on the spot. And if they were eaten, we were just going to burn it down. <laughs> but it, it would have lasted if one person would have fished it, it would have lasted for two days. Well, we were literally just going to burn it down how, how does that work this is really a good thing for people listening like how do you communicate with people like this do you like take a picture of them while they're sleeping and mail it to them like i mean what do you do i have enough feet pictures of christine fisher to start a website um no i'm joking so i mean christine christine and i have known each other for a little while now and you know when we were talking about it on the phone i was like she you know we were coming trying to come up with ideas like well, what if you started there first and I came in, you know, what if you fished it from like seven to nine and I can't, and I was like, that's really not fair. I was like, cause if, if I go there at seven and I know you're coming at nine, 
I'm not leaving any fish for mm. you. And just the same way you're going to be really hard. If you go in there and catch five fish, it's going to be really hard for you to say, all right, I, I want to leave some fish for Jake for when he comes. So I was like, the only way we can legitimately do this and do this the fair way is we can do it w- one of two things. And one's going to work out in my favor because my boat's faster than yours. Whoever gets there first gets it, or we can agree that we're both going to fish it together. And that's, that's the route that we took because that was the more fair option. Do you, is, is it, was it, easy to do this because you knew her or do you guys all just know each other in the top 10, 20? So it, the communication's easy. No, I think it was easier because it was her, um, because I know her and I have access to her. Not everybody has that kind of access to Christine. Christine's, you know, she's, I mean, she's basically a celebrity in the kayak fishing world yeah, in the, the, the fishing world in general. She's a celebrity. So not everyone has that kind of access to her. Um, I'm fortunate that I do. And I was able to communicate with her ahead of time. But if it was somebody that I wasn't friends with, I wouldn't have communicated it with them. I would have just beat them to the spot. And then whenever they came, I'd have been like, mm. <laughs> That's it. you know what I mean? Like playing uh, politics though is so freaking important. I've had, um, I actually had Blake miles on and we talked about this a little bit where, you know, Blake grew up fishing, you know, down South Kerr Reservoir, places like that. And he got to the Potomac and he's like, this feels a little weird where there's like bumper to bumper boats. Like you don't do this. And it's like being able to play politics, understanding the water you're on it. You have to get better at that because I saw in the wired to fish article, like some guys on like murder charges because of like a spot that they were fighting over. And then, yeah, you know, that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> we, we can't be doing that stuff and we can't right. be teaching that crap either to like everyone else coming up in this industry. And I agree with what you did there. It's like, yeah, get it off the water and, and try to hash that shit out. Because um, right. what else are you going to do? I mean, I mean, I was willing to arm wrestle Christine. So, <laughs> um, you know. Well, I, well, the segue off that thing. Day one, you get there with the conditions that you have. I mean, what goes down? So we pulled up to the spot and there was another guy that wanted to fish in that. I mean, we, for the lack of better words, we're going to call it Wood Creek. So Christine wanted to hit the mouth of Wood Creek and there was some structure right inside Wood Creek that where we wanted to start on. There was another guy that wanted to go up in Wood Creek to fish, but he, he agreed to not, you know, mess with the stuff that we wanted to fish. So we, we kind of staged outside the mouth. He came right his lines in and he started moving up um christine started fishing the mouth i was fishing a little bit around the mouth but i didn't really care so much about the mouth like i didn't really really didn't have a lot that interested me um so once we got into the area like literally we were making the same exact cast at the same exact time with the same exact bait and we were just presenting it was it, it would be i mean i guess it's similar to having you know like an A-rig. We were really just kind of like, wow. you know, we were throwing at the same exact stuff. And, you know, she, she hooked up first. She had like a 14 or something like that that she hooked up with. And literally on the very next cast, I hooked up with a 17 and a half, 17 and a quarter or something like that. Um, and we fished it for a little while longer together before I think she, I think she recognized the fact that, um, you know, I may or may not have had like a better position on the, on the structure. And I think she felt like until I caught a fish, I probably wasn't going to move. And I didn't intend to move because I was I was casting, you know, parallel to it. Um, And, you know, she she I mean, graciously was like, hey, she's like, it seems like you got the juju here. I'm going to go run some other waypoints. And then she left and went and ran some other waypoints. So but we were literally making the exact same cast at the exact same time to the exact same spot. Like it was and we coordinated that. (laughs) <laughs> when did it turn on for you then uh for me it didn't turn on really at all like i had planned um in practice you know in practice you know that was the other thing too like she she encountered the same thing in practice that i encountered so we knew that if one of us hooked up it was highly likely for the other one of us to hook up at the same time you know that's why we were doing what we were doing um so you know she or what was I going to say? Oh, for me, it didn't turn off. She left. And when she left, I continued up behind the other angler in Wood Creek. And then I fished like an opposite side of it than he did. 
And then at the very top end of that, you know, I, I was like, Hey man, I'm like, how you doing? Like, you got any? And he's like, no, not a single one. And I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm like, well, I'm sorry about that. And he's like, no, no problem. And he's like, I'm going to head down river. So he left. And then I basically had the Creek and the islands beside mm-hmm. it and a bunch of stuff basically to myself. So I, I started running a circle around it. And every time I'd run a circle and come back to that structure that I wanted to start on, literally it was every every time i ran that i came back and caught a keeper fish so, so um, to keep us grounded in, in in time what time giver roughly did you actually boat your first one oh keeper? i mean three minutes after lines in maybe okay three minutes and then and then you had the christy and you were fishing she left and then that was the gap where you really didn't have a lot and then you caught your second one So I had, I had fish, I'd been catching fish, but I wasn't submitting fish right away because of the rain, because of the rain, there was a shit show of things that happened on day one. So day one was, was calling for rain. And guess what? I left my house without a phone rain gear. Oh, (laughs) um, I fortunately enough had a a shisty little poncho in my back. So I threw on this, this, you know, very, very thin poncho, which kept me at least sort of dry but everything was wet my hands were wet my phone was wet everything was wet so as i was catching fish like i was struggling to take pictures of them but i was once i got the pictures i wasn't submitting them because i was waiting for the rain to stop i knew the rain was going to stop kind of like early afternoon um so i wouldn't necessarily say i struggled until there was about a three hour period midday when the rain was coming down the heaviest that i was miserable I was absolutely miserable. I had, you know, cold water running down my back. Mm. Um, I was getting wet. I was getting cold. At one point I caught myself shivering. Um, I was not dressed appropriately and that was all my fault. Um, so that, that's about the only time that I struggled. But other than that three hour period where I was just, I really wasn't even fishing that much because I was just, I wasn't in the right frame of mind. Um, when I was actually fishing to fish, like I was catching fish every, you know, every 15, 20 minutes. That's hard to do. I mean, whether it's the rain or, I mean, the last tournament I fished, I effed my back up badly at the gym and I was in, I was on heavy muscle relaxer driving a boat. Don't do that, everyone. But I could not (laughs) fish well at all. I was in so much pain and it's so weird, I guess, how it's not a context where it's not football where you need to have the right mindset and be physically there. You're just fishing, you know? And, you can still get out of your head and it's as simple as back pain or you don't bring your gear or you forget your sunglasses. It could be something your wife yelled at you, something stupid and it just throws right. you off mentally and you're, you're screwed the rest of the day. You really are. Yeah. And I see the comment section blowing up guys. As always, uh, I have about eight to 10 gift cards giving, giving away tonight. Just drop a comment and then I'll be getting to them here in a minute. We're going to finish up this tournament and then we're going to get into the comment section here. Um, to answer, sounds- quick, to answer your question real quick, yeah. Thomas. So lines in was at seven thirty, and I took the photo of that first keeper at seven forty one. So okay, didn't take very long. Yeah, no, that, that's okay. Yeah, so it wasn't it, for the way it was started to sound like you didn't have a fish yet when Christy was there, and it took you a while to get <clears> into that, that rhythm to really start catching them. No, when she was trying to measure her fourteen inch fish, when literally when she was trying to measure it, it jumped off her board as I hooked up with that seventeen and a half. Oh damn! Okay. Yeah, so she wasn't uh, she wasn't exactly happy. <laughs> In a tournament like this, you mentioned ninety inches, ninety inches plus. You need to actually do well. If I was fishing on the Potomac River and I dropped eighteen to twenty pounds, I'm probably leaving that area, or I'm just going to guard it. But I'm not going to just stick everything. Once I have the weight, I feel like that's as good as it's going to get. Do you do that at all, or? it ever or specifically in this tournament was that crossing your mind day one you're talking about just leaving the area and coming back like to save it just guarding it not sticking them anymore or like does has that ever happened it doesn't have to be in this tournament just in general in a kayak Uh, yeah i've done that in in uh when i won at lake seminole i did that you did that Um, i did that at lake seminole just because i had nothing else i feel like on this river i would never do that I would never, because there's fish to be caught all over this river. Um, I might not really lean on them, but, you know, I'm not going to sit there and just guard a spot because I feel like there's so many things that can change on a river system, you know. Um, There's so many things that can change from day to day. 
Like I, <clears throat> I came back to that spot probably seven or eight times throughout the day. And each time I came back to it, I would, I would land a keeper. So, and I, I really wasn't really concerned about, you know, Oh, is this going to be okay for tomorrow? Because I knew with the increased flow that no matter what those fish were going to be eaten. So for this specific tournament, I didn't, I didn't really, didn't never even cross my mind to be honest with you. So day one, <clears throat> you, cracked, you cracked 91 inches. Um, when you get home and you get your rain gear, what is your thought process? What adjustments are you thinking about making? So I knew when I left a 17 and a half inch fish on the board, I knew that I was way, way behind. Um, I had 91 inches and I knew that I needed to make up about 10 inches. Um, because I, for what I had to go into day two, I needed about 10 inches more than what I had on day one. Um, <clears throat> So my thought process was big baits, big fish. Um, I loaded up on some, you know, some bigger stuff and went out throwing it, but the water was, had dirtied up considerably more than it was on day one. So I, I put a jackhammer in my hand and tossed it in there and, you know, caught a fish fairly early. I went to the, I went to that spot that Christine and I were, went to and I didn't get bit there. So I, I went up to where I landed my, second keeper on day one and i caught a 19 i think 19 inch fish off of the point of that one island Oof. and as soon as i caught that 19 inch fish i kind of knew the rest of the day like all right they, they, why am i messing around over here i need to go over to mid-river stuff and fish these islands and after that it was just boom 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 every front tip of an island <clears throat> if that island had some grass on the front of it every it was clockwork there, there was a 19 inch fish there with with your kayak setup and because i mean you don't have a 250 on the back just for all the boaters that are listening right now and you're you're hopping to island to island how many islands were in the area if there weren't a lot how much time were you spending going from island to island so mid-river there was a lot of islands clustered together okay um so it, it wasn't i didn't really have to run too far but the areas that i had to run to certainly um where it was difficult because the wind was blowing directly up river. So I was on the motor, uh, like hard on the motor almost all day long that I was out there. You know, my boat will go about six and a half miles an hour fully loaded. So, you know, if I, if I have to go up and down river, you know, I, th I would say I probably fished a mile and a half or two mile stretch of islands in the middle of the river, but going back and forth between them all, like I was, you know, I was, uh, I was certainly, <laughs> using some battery power for sure did you bring a backup battery i did but um my first battery running to that first spot it took about 50 percent because knowing that i didn't have the communication with christine the night before that we weren't we weren't like we weren't going to fish it together i was afraid somebody else was going to beat me there so i was literally balls to the wall all morning like the first you know when we launched at 7 a.m I hammered down and I didn't, didn't hammer up until I got there. So it was about 50% of my battery and I just wanted to make sure I got there first. That ended up biting me in the ass at, at the end of the day on day two. So how now I ran out of battery power about mm, 1230. Oh shit. Yeah. So I uh, ran the batteries, both batteries completely dead by 1230 and it was comical. Like I was literally, I pulled into the boat ramp and I had a, what I have like an 18 and three quarter inch fish was my smallest fish. And I, the wind was blowing so hard up river that you actually, you were getting blown up river. So I, I literally pulled into the boat ramp cause I, what I intended to do was put one of my batteries on charge in the vehicle and try to charge it up and get back out there for a little bit in the afternoon. Um, but I pull into the boat ramp and as I'm cruising into the boat ramp, I seen a dark spot sitting beside a log and it didn't look like it was a log or a rock or anything like that. So I'm like, that's oh weird. Gosh. So I pull into the boat ramp, turn around, face back up river, cast to it, boom, 19 and a quarter inch fish. So Dude. I, was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, this is, this is cool. Like I literally started laughing. It was pretty comical. Dude, that's freaking awesome. So, so go, keep going. No, I mean, that, that was, you know, that was the end of day two. After that, I called, 
Um, I called uh, the tournament director, Steve-O, and I asked him, I'm like, hey, man, I'm like, am I allowed to do what I'm getting ready to do? And he's like, I don't know. And I was like, well, <laughs> I was like, can it, let me ask you this. I was like, can I have someone bring me a battery? If there's a, if I have a friend here locally that has a battery, can I have them bring me one? And he's like, let me check. So he got back to me a couple minutes later and was like, no, that would be the equivalent of a bass boat filling up with gas mid tournament. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, I'm going to check out. I'm done for the day. I'm going to go watch some football over a burger and fries. So we'll see where it falls. So when was your day done with then? Like let's say you were done, done. 1230. 1230. Holy shit, dude. So That's Thomas, insane. like I could have I could have chanced it and gone back out there with just a paddle, but getting blown up river in that wind, and I knew that the wind had not had there was no forecast for the wind to die down. As a matter of fact, it was supposed to pick up. I didn't want a chance not making it back to the ramp in time and and potentially ruining that 96 inch limit of fish that I had on day two because I would have had penalties and stuff. So I, we, I'd like to talk about on this show about being conservative because we're always taught you got to fish to win and all that. And I think it's bullshit. Like sometimes you just got to, you got to play the hand you're dealt. When you look at what Josh did with uh, 194 inches, do you think he still made the good decision? Like, Hey, there was, it was going to be a real shot in hell to catch him. So it was better to be conservative and not risk losing what you had. Mm, I, th- I think, I, th- I think he was catchable. You think he was catchable still? Maybe not by me, but by a couple of people, he was catchable. Well, well, by you, yeah. I was thinking by you yourself. I mean, it, it would. So I guess it would have depended. Like if if he hadn't he if he hadn't gone out early on day two and caught him real good, um, you know, if he would have came in with a 92, 93, 91 inch limit or something like that, I could have caught him. But like the guys in second and third ahead of me, I think they each had over one hundred and ninety inches as well. Like for for sure. He could, I mean, let's be realistic. Like if I would have caught two 20 inch fish, I would have been right there real close to him. You know what I mean? So it, it I don't know. Like it was, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily looking at it to play conservative. Um, I, I honestly didn't think I was going to make it back to the boat ramp the way that wind was blowing. Cause with the inflatable, like you get literally just get pushed. Mm-hmm. There's nothing underneath to keep you, you know, from getting pushed. So I was getting pushed up river all day long, which is why I ran out of battery so early because, you know, I was getting pushed. And that's a, that leads into this great question here by David Williams, uh, because we can go into the whole, I want you to pimp out the kayak. Uh, what type of batteries uh, are you using? So my motor system actually requires you to use a battery that they, that comes with the motor. It's called a Torquedo. Um, they're lithium batteries though. They're, uh, high grade lithium batteries are very expensive but they're they're worth it because of the longevity of the battery itself they last a lot longer than your typical lithium batteries will and then uh what's a kayak that you're running for everyone that has not heard of you or or okay so the uh the kayak is an innovative innovative sportsman osprey 1436 for river fishing i don't think that there's a better kayak out there because of how shallow you can draft and how stealthy you are it is an inflatable kayak Um, but you know, I only draft about two inches of water at most. Um, so, you know, I can really kind of scoot into places that most people would have to get out of their boat and drag to. And it really just makes it pretty easy for me to get in and around this river and do what I like to do, do here. So, and And we got, we got our first, let's see, we got our first winner here. We got Tony. Tony Bryant, you are a winner of a Jake's Bait and Tackle gift card. Message me on Instagram or Facebook and I can get that to you. The day two video, you was obviously aver- aggravated with Russ. Was that because he was leading, question mark, or the pressure to get your five? Oh, um, I was aggravated that he asked me to come into where I was at. Um, whenever I saw him at the tip of an Island up at the end of where, like he was up river, maybe a quarter of a mile from me, I saw someone, I didn't know who it was, but someone was there at the tip of that Island. And I was like, well, I'm not going to go up river because I don't want to encroach on what they're doing. I'm just going to cruise in here and fish these islands and not bother that person up there. And I literally pulled in and I caught a fish within maybe two or three minutes of being there. And then he came down river and as I was measuring the fish, he came around the corner and was like, Hey, do you mind if I cut in there? 
And I looked over and I was, I'm like, where, where are you trying to cut in? Cause like, I'm literally fishing these islands. You know what I mean? Is what I'm thinking to myself. Like, why are you trying to come in here? I'm fishing in here. And he's like, do you mind if I cut in there? And I'm like, where are you trying to go to? I think is what I said. And he's like, I can't hear you. And then he came over to me and he's like, do you mind if I cut in there? I'm leading this thing. And I looked over at him and I'm like, I understand that Russ, I'm in contention too. Mm. Oh, it's Jake. I didn't know that was you. To me, it doesn't matter. (laughs) It doesn't matter who's there, who, or who I am or who you are. If you see that I'm fishing an area, why in the hell would you want to come in and fish it with me or ask me if you can go in front of me? And when he asked me again, I was like, man, I was like, I can't tell you what to do. You know, I can't tell you what to do. Um, He should have picked up on the clue, but he didn't pick up on the clue. So the the end result was I didn't let it bother me very long because I knew if I was going to let it bother me, I was going to be pissed off and I wasn't going to fish good. So um, I told him to do basically do whatever he wanted to do. And I turned around and went down river and fished more islands. And as soon as I left him, I caught a 19 and a quarter inch fish at another tip of an island. So I think that's a very good ethical debate about fishing where I, I get it, where if you're leading the tournament and you fish the same spot every day, um, uh, Luke, I think it was, um, Justin Lucas won on the same damn pier in DC five days in a row, four days in a row. If you come up to him and try to take his spot, that's where I feel like that's the dick move. I don't know about the idea where if you're leading the tournament, that justifies you telling everyone else to get the hell out away from me when you show up to a spot. Either if you that, that, so that was my, that was the way that I took what he came in and was asking me to do. Because if, if it was just someone asking to cut through and go to the other side of the river, which is what I think I clarified, I'm like, are you trying to go to the other side of the river? And he's like, no, I'm just, I'm just covering water. Like, okay, well, you were all the way up there, a quarter of a mile up river covering water. Why'd you come down here to cover water? Like, you you know, I don't know if he Mm -hmm. saw me cut in there, but if he did see me cut in there and then came down, that's even more suspect because you saw someone cutting in area that you haven't fished yet. And now you want to come down and ask them if you can fish it and that you're using the justification that just because you're leading the thing that you should be entitled to it. No, get the, oh, get the hell out of here. You know, easy, easy. easy. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to get a DQ card guys. We have over, we just jumped up to about 45 people watching there. Please give it a like this. Please give it a like the old Facebook and YouTube. It helps out Matthew. Uh, fun fact. There are actually a fair few places in VA where the bass eat the stock trout. I'm not going to say where, uh, well, it's not just in, in Virginia. That's dude. <laughs> yeah. Spo- spoilers to everyone. The DWR shows you where they stock it. So it's just Google that. You'll find it. But yeah, they absolutely. My favorite bass fishing lakes to fish in Pennsylvania are Pennsylvania approved trout waters because they put a bunch of seven, eight, nine inch trout in there. And those bass get huge off of that. One of the biggest fish I ever lost, I was throwing a trout swim bait and it was the day after they stocked it. And I I broke off and then he jumped and it, it looked like a carp. I mean, they will absolutely smoke them. Um, let's see. We got <laughs> Tony Brandt. Easy, Jake. Easy. Um, let's see. We got, oh my God, you guys are being weird. Okay. Michael, what's your favorite thing to throw in murky water? Chatterbait. The old jackhammer. This is actually my favorite color. It's the new color Z-Man just came out with this year. It's dirty white. It's got a gold blade. It's got some black strands in it. got a white belly. That thing is the tits. And Michael, uh, here, message me on Instagram or Facebook. You just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. We got Eric Cleland. I am sorry. I can't speak properly. I don't know why. It's a mental deficiency. So I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. Is there a certain water temperature where the fall feeding really takes off? (sighs) I don't know. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a certain water temperature. It's just that whenever they start feeling that, that temperature drop, um, but I honestly don't even really think it's so much temperature as much as it is length of day, length of daylight. Um, I think length of daylight plays a lot more into when fall feeding starts than than water temperature does. I think I think time of day is huge. And if you could ever crack that formula of when that happens, oh my God. Because <laughs> there there is a there's a time to- there is at some point you lose the right amount of time where the foliage starts dying off, grass does, and the fish move. 
Yeah. No one knows it or no one's telling one. But if you could figure that out, holy crap, you would you'd get rich in a hurry. Yeah. Michael Mason, when the water temp drops to the low 60s, highs 50s, where did the smallmouth go depth wise? And what should I throw? Good question. Uh, I mean, for me, I've been fishing less than three feet of water and catching them pretty good. Um, I don't think that they go really deep right now. Um, you know, specific to the Susquehanna, I think that they're going to stay fairly shallow for a good majority of the rest of the year because with certain invasive species occupying the winter holes, um, Flathead. it's difficult for them to uh, to go into those winter holes and be safe anymore. So. Um, yeah, the, the they're starting. Out. They're starting to winter a little bit differently in different areas. I got a so <clears throat> side note. I got nominated two weeks ago. Now I'm on the Black Bass Advisory Board for for Maryland. And nice. one of the issues one of the issues that came up was Mr. Flatty, because apparently this is allegedly. I've never seen it, so I'm going to say allegedly a thousand times. There are anglers that are starting to use smallmouth as bait uh, on the Upper Potomac, and that's getting the DWR. Uh, to acknowledge the issue a little bit more. So yeah, I mean, the flathead are not just a sussy problem. Uh, it's, it's an issue, multiple areas. Yeah. We'll just leave it, leave it at that for now, since I value my life. Uh, Matthew, I was out in the Susque above Harrisonburg the week of the tournament. It was on fire yesterday. Not so much. Um, we had, what was the, for the people that don't know, was there an out of limits area for the Susquehanna? So <clears throat> the boundaries for the for the Bassmaster tournament were basically Sun or not Sunbury, um, Duncannon, all the way north to where the main stem splits and goes to North Branch and West Branch. You could go up the West Branch and up the North Branch. I want to say the North Branch was Shikshini, and I forget what the West Branch boundary was. I had zero intentions of going that far up because it's like an hour and forty five minute drive from my house. So I chose to go like 45 minutes. I didn't even look at the northern boundaries, to be honest with you. So going back to the bait thing, did you literally just lock a chatterbait in your hand 24-7? Or did you what was your assortment? Spinnerbait, chatterbait, and um the Jeff Little special, the old seven inch jerk shad. Caught a couple of fish on the seven inch jerk shad. That for so the thing about the seven inch jerk shad is it's not a good muddy water bait. Um I've you know, where, where I was able to find clear water, I was throwing this and they were eating it pretty good. Um, but for when it, when the water dirtied up and day two, the entire, almost the entire river was, was chock full of mud. There was like maybe a 10 foot sliver on the West side of the river that was clean. Everything else was just straight mud. So I threw a chatterbait and spinnerbait for most of the day. Please don't anybody ask me what spinnerbait I was throwing because I'm not going to tell you. Does that matter as much as the blade type and the color? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> no, I'll tell you. So the willow, the willow leaf blades are are the big player. Like if you can get the Why? bigger the willow, um, I think it's just because it matches the, the forage here. Um, the willow leaves, and I, I personally, I think a big willow leaf blade gives just as much vibration as a Colorado blade does. Um, I really think it depends on how you work it. But <clears throat> for me, um, I was throwing a spinner bait that's not made anymore. And they cost about $30 a piece to when you do find them on eBay. That, that's interesting because I was always taught Al Linder, like a big ass Colorado in muddy water. Like, don't use the willow leaf. It's just interesting that you said like, oh, no, no I'd use a willow. Yeah, I might have two Colorado bladed spinner baits in my entire box. Hmm. I don't prefer them. I so I think some of it has to do maybe not so much with vibration, but some of it has to do with speed, right? You can work a willow leaf a lot faster, and you can still get that that you know you're not getting the the th the thick th thud. Th yeah. You're getting a th 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 you know what I mean? And I I just feel like the willow leaves because you can work it faster, you're still getting vibration, but you're able to work it faster through the water column. And I would rather work it faster. Um, Are you using a trailer or a stinger hook with that? No, I'm so I'm weird. A lot of people will disagree with me on this, but I feel like with smallmouth, especially with spinner baits, not all spinner baits have big hooks. Most spinner baits have small hooks. And when you put a trailer on that spinner bait and that smallmouth comes up to eat it, a lot of times that trailer folds over and it affects your hook set. Yeah. So I don't like when especially when I'm fishing for for smallmouth, I don't throw any trailers ever, really. 
Oh my goodness, guys. You are just flooding the questions here. We got uh we got Ru- Rusty Lane. Rusty, I think no, you haven't yet. You just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Message me Instagram, Facebook. You know the deal. You can get it. Question. Most say downsize in the fall for a largemouth. Does that same does that same thing apply for smallmouth? Because that's some big baits in the fall for smallmouth. I would never downsize in the fall. Fall is when I would upsize, actually. There you have it. Super easy right there. Go yeah. big. Go with a 10 inch Huddleston. For me, I just feel like they're, you know, th- these fish are feeding up for the winter time. Like they're trying to get, you know, they're trying to get fat. They're trying to b- build up them fat reserves. They're eating big meals and they're eating a lot of meals. Um, <clears throat> so I would throw big. Yeah. Always go big, guys. Um, let's see. Matthew again. Uh, okay, we already did that one. I'm sorry, guys. Look at this. I can't even keep track of my own uh, own chat. Uh, love that this this chat is all about the Susquehanna. Guys, yeah, it's part of the DMV, baby. The problem with where we live is you have to drive everywhere to fish. The people in Alabama are selfish because they, they can walk to like five Great Lakes. I mean, <laughs> if I want to fish a BFL at Kerr, that's like 12 hours in the car. So we're used yeah. to commuting. Um, and I live in Maryland, so like, yeah, Susquehanna's not that far from me anyway. Uh, let's see. Big old oh, here little. we go. Oh, that is a big willow leaf. I got two. Are, are you throwing that on a glass rod or are you going with a, a graphite? Like, and what so, speed? I actually just switched up to a new spinnerbait rod that I'm giving, putting through the paces. Um, it's actually just a regular graphite uh, rod, but TFO's new Taction line they came out with uh, this. Just released it. I mean, I'm trying to figure out which way to go here, but it's a 705 medium heavy. Um, it's got a fast tip, but I, it's not. When I bend it, it doesn't it doesn't look fast. Hmm. It looks more like a like a moderate fast tip i do like typically for my spinner baits um and i think that's why this fast tip fast taper rod is actually uh kind of suits my liking because it does bend pretty deep into the blank it's not your typical g loomis fast it's 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 pretty it bends pretty moderate are you pairing that with fluorocarbon are you going like 14 16 17 what are you doing any kayak um, very specific about this. Kayaks get pulled towards fish when you set the hook. Okay. Yep. So I, every single one of my rods has a braid main line to a fluorocarbon leader. And typically, um, the fluorocarbon leader is not very long because I don't want any stretch when I'm getting pulled towards a big fish. So if I pull, if I set the hook on a fish, my boat is going to turn towards that fish. You don't have those issues in a bass boat. So because of that getting pulled towards the fish, I want zero stretch. And that's why all my all of my reels will have like a braid main line to a fluorocarbon leader in a hookup ratio. One hundred I got I I dabbled two years ago now with MVKBA. Uh huge shout out to MVKBA, by the way. Um, with them last year. And then <clears throat> I sucked because everything I have, like especially with my crankbait setup, it's lighter. And so I could set and take a couple steps back. That's what I usually did. Go for it. Uh, um, but I would I would set and take a few steps back. That's what I did in college. Everything I had a very light uh, ratio. Plus I have they don't make this real anymore. Can I say it's a Daiwa Zillion Crazy Crank uh, uh, reel, and it's like a three point eight. And that was a setup that I had really good luck with in college and high school because you could count every rock and you could go super slow. And I smoked them in specific instances with that setup. Um, but then going with that slow gear ratio, super, super flexible rod. And I got in a kayak, the, the amount of fish I lost at Lake Anna and I lost because you set the hook on that, just that mushy stick. And then there's the bow and everything. And then cut to this tournament where I got big fish at Sleater's Lake. Um, I just jacked everything up a little bit more than I usually do. And I'd set like a mother and then I'd pedal backwards and that started to help a little bit more. I'm thinking next year I'm going to, I'm going to stiffen it up even more, but yeah, there is something to be said with that devil in the detail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, for me, it, when I first started kayak fishing, I, I was losing everything. And, and that's because I was throwing like, I, had, you know, I had like some, some lose rods, like a store bought, you know, or not store bought, but like, Walmart lose types rods, you know, where the, even their fast actions are pretty moderate. They got a pretty, you know, pretty good bend in them. And I was throwing like mono cause I was going cheap, you know? So I, w- I had a, a big bendy rod with some big stretchy line and every fish that I hooked up with, I would lose. 
So then I started doing some research and I'm like, okay, I need a faster gear ratio reel. I need a less bend, like less moderate bend rod. And what can I do to get rid of this stretch? Because when you grab fluorocarbon and you go like this, you can literally mm. not fluorocarbon, but monofilament, you can see it stretch. I'm like, I got to take the stretch out. I got to take the play out. Um, and as soon as I did that, I started my hookup ratio got much better. Fluorocarbon stretches too. I think people, I think it stretches more than people think, especially older fluorocarbon. Yeah. It definitely stretches more. My favorite fluorocarbon because it doesn't stretch a lot is Sunline uh, Super FC. Yep. 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 Favorite. If you can afford it, guys, uh, Tackle Warehouse has their Black Friday day sales. It's not that too far away. Stock up. I mean, oh, that's, I know. You I, know I, how I, many I, big spools I bought last year? Like 45% off? That's what I do. That's what I do. <laughs> That's the only way I can stay married. Uh, yeah. I just tell her the the the, the bank account's only going to hurt for one day. <laughs> oh my god, guys! Oh, okay, we got Dan Grove here. Dan, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle? Um, so message me on Facebook, Instagram, so you can kind of get that uh, best base for tournaments. We've been talking about that. Well, is he asking about the specifics of going? Because he said best bait for the tournament. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's true. Um, so, best bait for the tournament. I would have to go with what the leader was throwing. Um, and he was throwing on day one, he was throwing a bull shad. Um, like so. Oh, that's so cool. So he was throwing one of those on day one until a muskie took it. And then he switched up to a mag draft, a six inch mag draft on day two at the end of day one and day two. So they were eating big. Um, Russ Snyder's also, I think he threw a mag draft for majority of the both days. Um, they were eating big stuff. Um, you know, I the reason I was catching fish on what I was catching fish on is because it made sense. Dirty water, you're throwing a big, you know, you're throwing a jackhammer or you're throwing a big spinnerbait. I think I could have also caught those fish on a mag draft or a bull shad because it's big enough profile that they would have been able to see it. But I'm much, much, much more confident in a spinnerbait or a jackhammer than I am a big swim bait in tournament fishing. Um, Why? Why? Uh, I just feel like there's a lot of margin for error with this with the big swim bait. I feel like you can lose more fish on treble hooks than you can on, you know, a big beefy hook on a jackhammer or, you know, this the spinnerbait that I was throwing. It had a small hook, but God, that hook was sharp. Oh my goodness. Let's see. I know I have a problem telling it. Guys, I got to find my spot again. Sorry about that. All righty. We got, I already did that one. Uh, evening, everyone. Hello, sir. We got, what are you using for your horizontal rod staging? Staging. So, yeah. So I have on the right side of my kayak, um, I typically try to land fish on the left side of my kayak just because it's my net hand. That's where my net's at over on that side. So I'll, I'll almost always play fish over to the left side to land them. So on the right side of my kayak, I put a Jackson rod stager. Um, I bought the two that's, I think it's a set of rod stagers. Um, they basically have like this little bungee cord that holds them in. And then there's three, there's three slots that you can put rods. And then I attach that to the track on my boat. Cause my boat has full length track along it. So my rods will literally sit just off to my right hand side inside that little bungee secured. Um, and it keeps them from getting like hung up in the trees and stuff behind me because I, I like to get close quarters whenever I fish. And then let's see. And then we got uh, Mike in here. Another good one. Nice recap. Great hearing Jake's thoughts on his time in the water as I'm really glad to get Jake on the show here. Jake's had a hell of a year. So, oh my God. I can, Brent, what's the best foot pick you got? <laughs> Jesus God. <laughs> my own. I was waiting for someone to I do mean, that. I mean, ha- do I need to pull these bad boys out? Because I have some beautiful feet. How well, do you think you afford two you? batteries? What's that? Like, How do you think is you your, is your viewers going to go up if I show my feet on this thing? I mean, like, you well, never first know. off, is your wife watching? Because I don't want her to get all hot and bothered by looking at these bad boys. They're beautiful. I mean, guys, this is how he's able to afford that beautiful kayak setup he's got there. Sock uh, off. And this is also how this is why Jeff hangs out with him. Uh, let's see. Jeff, I hope you're not listening. Yeah, he probably's not listening. Uh, let's see. Day, day two. Oh, uh, Mr. Oh, here we go. Mr. C, uh, how muddy was the water you fish on Saturday compared uh, on Sunday compared to Saturday? Uh, it dirt real dirty. So Saturday, about half the river was clean and 
probably a quarter of the river was stained and then the very far east side was was dirty um but sunday it was dirt dirt dirty and that was because they lowered the dam up there in sunbury and it washed all that all that shit down so chris what if what if it is someone's out of contention wouldn't it be like ra- like racing let the leader pass by i got to read that again uh, he's talking about the rust situation about oh the rust situation so i so here's the thing like i i don't know if you're in contention or not whenever i see you from a quarter mile away i am the type of angler that if i see you i'm not coming in I'm not going to, I'm not going to get close enough to find out who you are. You know, in kayaks, we don't have, you know, most of us don't have wrapped boats and stuff like that. We don't know who's who and all that, but personally, I, I'm not getting that close to find out. So. I, I would, I would also say guys, we're talking about the Susquehanna personally for me, if you're springtime on the tidal Potomac river, that's, there's always exceptions to the rule about how close you get to anglers about, I understand that, but generally, yeah, you want to keep your distance. Cause I know people will be like, what about on the Potomac Tom? You talk about that. Like, yeah, I'm talking, that's such a unique circumstance there where there's fish only in two creeks. You know what I mean? Like you're going to be a little closer. Yeah. I mean, certain times of the year, you're going to end up fishing on top of each other really. And that, that was kind of the point that I also made to Russ whenever he went by. I was like, Russ, I can't tell you what to do. And he's like, well, I'm covering water. And I'm like, okay, well, so am I. I'm literally doing the same. I said, and I even said to him, I said, we're doing the same exact thing. We're going to end up fishing in front and behind each other all day. And that's why I was like, you know, I as soon as he was gone, it was done. Like To me, like, I'm like, okay, I wouldn't have done that, but I'm not him and he's not me. I just need to go fish what I know how to fish. And I don't give a shit what he does. It was basically my mindset. So, do you ever use the stealth played jackhammer? And this is Bradley Germain. Yeah, man, they, you guys—they're asking good questions. I don't like them. I don't like these questions. <laughs> yes, I use the stealth played jackhammer quite a bit. Um, clear water, I like the stealth played jackhammer. Um, pressured water, I like the stealth played jackhammer. I have Bradley. Been- I have a video of the springtime where I was fishing um, and I absolutely hammered them. I had over 20 pounds of my best five on, on the stealth bleed. So dude, that's another good question guys. Yeah. Keep them rolling in here. We're almost getting to the end of this thing here, which is great. Uh, we got Matthew again. Sometimes I think I see Jake and then he motors away. <laughs> uh, that's Matthew. probably accurate. Uh, my feet have a wicked <laughs> That's uh, okay. That's awesome. Uh, Mark, do you prefer the stealth blade over the mini? Ooh, the mini blade too. God, there's so yeah. many versions now. I, I prefer the stealth blade over the mini version. Um, I think the mini version has a purpose. I just don't think it has a purpose for me. And we got uh, Mark, uh, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Message me on Instagram, Facebook, the whole shebang. You can get your card. Again, guys, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out in the algorithm here. And we got we got two questions from JL Scott Fishing Needs. Do you prefer battle baits over snag blar blar spinner baits? That's tough. Um, so so snaggler snaggler tackle is a local guy here who makes really, really good spinner baits, and his colors are his color options are unmatched for this river. Nobody has good as good of colors as he does. Um, the downside of what his baits are is, you know, because he uses a very thin gauge wire, um, they bend out often and, and you can break them. Um, Battle Baits has figured out a way to use a little bit, just a very, very minimal, heavier gauge. And they have some good colors and blade combinations. Um, I don't think I would prefer one over the other. I think they both work pretty well, but the one spinner bait that I, God, this, this, the one spinner bait that is unmatched and no one has made a spinner in my opinion, it's no longer made anymore. <laughs> it's, it's only able to be found on eBay. It's made by, uh, it was made by Jackal. I've always been. If you buy a bait though, and this is, I, I, there's so many stories of people like they have that special bait they bought on eBay and stuff. And, and you see it now with the, the glide bait cult that's growing. 
I don't even know if I would want to have that in my box. Like it's a crankbait that it's a four hundred dollar uh, old school Bagley or something like that, rock crawler, whatever, and you lose it, or you are catching them great on it. Your whole tournament is based on one bait. I don't know if I could deal with that anxiety of like, all right, cool, I am one one f up away from being in a lot of trouble. I, I guess I didn't really. I don't really think of it like that. Um, you know, I I only bring out. I'll just tell everybody. I mean, there people aren't going to be able to find them. The Jackal Super Eruption um, is the best spinner bait of all time. It is the best spinner bait that's ever been made. Oh lord! It is the hardest vibrating spinner bait that you can work fast. It that spinner bait will vibrate way harder than any Colorado blade you ever throw. It literally feels like a jackhammer. Um, it's the bait, and I have about 30 of them. I only pull those out during tournament. How do you have 30? <laughs> don't ask questions that you don't need. <laughs> Listen, I may or may not have worked out a couple drug deals, okay? Like, I got 30 of them, and you don't need to know how I got them, okay? I may or may not have knocked off a, a, a tackle shop. I don't know. We're not – I can't incriminate myself on YouTube. It's – I may or may not have had to do some very weird things to get those. Ah, oh, just you low key saying like I bought a store out. Oh my god! No, no, honestly. So, so it worked out kind of awesome. To be honest with you, there was a guy who had collected them, and he was like a collector of these things. And then he went from collecting these to collecting swim baits. And I was like, so bud, I was like, you know, what you, what, what are you looking to get for these? And he's like, man, he goes, I could probably sell you twenty five of them. Cause he had like a hundred. Um, he's like, I could probably sell you 25 of them. And I'm like, what, what are you looking at price range? And he's like, man, I don't know. What are they going for nowadays? And I was like, I didn't want to lie to the guy. Cause I, fi I figured if I lied to the guy and he knew the answer that he was going to probably call my bluff and just like, I'm not selling them to you. So I was like, they're about 25 bucks a piece on eBay when you can find them. And he's like, well, he goes, what about, he's like, what would you do? What would you say about like 300 bucks? And I'm like, Mm, how about a hundred bucks and two glide baits that I have, you know, that, you know, I could trade. Okay. And he's like, he's like, yeah, hell yeah, I'd do that. And I'm like, deal. So, I mean, I made a weird deal with a guy on Facebook and we exchanged money and I trusted him to send me the baits that he promised me. And I sent him baits so it was a like I was literally for about a week I was sitting there on edge I'm like shit man I just sent I just sent a hundred dollars and like two hundred dollars worth of glide baits in the mail and I don't know if this guy's even real he could be like oh that's oh, yeah that's sketchy like, as hell not that. good but we actually became friends and and I he's a he's a contact that whenever I'm done with my twenty five I'm going to see if he has any more. There you go, guys. That's how you do it. Meet the guy at the old glory hole and hope that he uh, he delivers. Oh, you said – can I say glory hole on here? I could have made that story so much better. Yeah, you can you say whatever I can say you glory hole. Like, dude, yeah, I was in a truck stop and I – line him up. <laughs> Next. <laughs> I'm, I made the I made the the, the the wrong error of trying to monetize a live stream, and it gave me hell. So from now on, I just don't even try to monetize the damn thing since it's being re-uploaded. It makes life Dude, so I had no much idea easier. I could say glory hole. I could have made that story so much more awesome. And you guys, yeah, you lit up so – that's a little uh, – yeah. So he lit up really good when he knew he could say the old glory hole. So whatever he does at work stays at work. Mark, uh, do you generally prefer the same colored blades or do you like to go one gold, one silver, and which do you prefer on the upper blade? Um, Most of them are – most of the ones that I have are silver, but I think sometimes when you get into dirtier water, it does help to have a contrasting color, whether it's silver or, or gold. I really don't think too much into which where they're at and on the bait. Um, <clears throat> I I prefer if I'm throwing. I, I hate tandem spinner baits. I don't like a willow leaf and a Colorado leaf on or a Colorado blade on the same. I don't I don't like those kinds of spinner baits for some reason. I don't have success with them. I don't like them, so I don't throw them. I think I have two total downstairs. If I went and looked, there would be like two down there. But almost everything is double willow, or I have a couple double Colorado blades. 
I've also heard copper too. If you can find copper blades, that they can also, in certain circumstances, do well, especially down here on the Shenandoah and and, and the Upper Potomac. So um, I do think I do think gold has a very um, significant place on the Susquehanna River in the summertime. Fall time, I feel like they're they're keyed in so much on shad and other bait fish. Like I just think that it doesn't matter what color you throw. You could go out there and throw. I don't know. You could throw anything. I mean, let's see. Ooh, here's a two good questions back to back. Uh, Matthew, uh, let's see. And Matthew, you just won a gift card at Jake's Bait and Tackle. Message me on Instagram or Facebook and you can get that. Um, my, com- my computer should be blowing up. And then guys, for your gift cards, I work a day job. So you will get your gift card in 48 hours. I'm going to try to get through them, but just don't expect them tonight. Uh, what rod are you using for jerk baits on kayaks? I feel like I need a shorter rod. So I have a seven foot. Well, this is actually a seven foot one. I don't know where my seven foot's at. I think it's downstairs. So I have a seven foot TFO resolve bass. It's a seven foot medium fast. That's what I use for my jerk baits. I don't know why this bait is tied on to the seven foot one because it shouldn't be. Um, I might have made an error, but that's what I use. Seven foot. It has a relatively short butt section. And I don't know. This camera doesn't really, I don't know. But that's that's what I use for, for jerk baits. But I don't throw a lot of jerk baits. Um, I know they have a good, they have a good purpose. Um, they have a certain time of year that they're, you know, the best thing to throw. But I, uh, I hate jerk baits. That's bold. That's a bold statement. Yeah, I hate them. Why? I don't have, I don't have a good answer for you. I literally hate them. Okay, there we go. Hey, we all have our prejudices. Uh, let's go. Bob Browning, what size braid and what not for your leader? So any rod that I have that's a medium power is a 20-pound braid. Medium heavy is 30-pound braid for the main line. Um, my heavy, I have one heavy that I use for swim baits. And, um, I think that's a 40 pound braid to a 20 pound fluorocarbon leader. And then I have one heavy rod that just has straight 50 pound braid that I use for like topwater frogs and, um, uh, ploppers and stuff like that. And that's, that's basically it. I, I don't really, I don't have any rods that are 65 pound braid cause you're not going to catch me flipping grass. It's not something that I like to do. So, um, Yeah. And my knot for my leader is an Alberto. Alberto! Let me see if I can pull up this knot. Who you go, Alberto, not the FG? Uh, yeah, I don't have the patience to tie an FG. And I'm borderline stupid, so I have no idea really what the hell I'm doing. Well, I'm not borderline. I'm full on stupid. Uh, that's why they have Adderall. Yeah. Um, so, hold on. I got to get through my all of my leader here. So, this is... Wait, there it is. That's a good background. Back. That's oh. a clean knot, though. Damn. Yeah. So that's the Alberto. Um, I don't know if you can see. Mm-hmm. It's 10 wraps. 10 wraps down, 10 wraps back. And I'm moistening. I'm moistening that knot up so good. And then I just pull it tight. <laughs> so, guys, that will also serve you well in the bedroom. So that's like- <laughs> <laughs> You have to moisten the knot before you go tightening it up. And then, Ow, uh, fuck. and then there you go. And then make sure that, uh, yeah, you don't stick yourself with the uh-huh. extracurricular stuff. And then if you guys want an Alberto knot video, Jeff little probably has about six of them on his channel. So, <laughs> you know, you, you know, he, damn it. That hurt. That was a bullshit hook right in the finger. We were going to learn how to take a trouble hook out on a live camera. Yeah. So, so last year I was fishing with Jeff and he, he would tie, I think he was tying like the uni, the uni, the double uni, or I don't know. And I'm like, Jeff, I'm like, why don't you do an Alberto? It's a lot, it's a lot cleaner knot. He's like, well, this, I've used this for 20 years. I'm like, can I teach you something? Like <laughs> we sit here on this rock and I teach you something. And he's like, he's like, sure. So I'm literally sitting there showing him how to, how to tie it. And he's like, all right, I'll try it. And then he started using it. And then he had a little bit, a couple knot failures because he wasn't going back through the right direction. But I think I've converted him completely. Wow. I think I've, that's I think, I think I've converted Jeff Little. That's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. So that is that's that is something there. Uh, oh, we got Steve. We got a couple more guys, and then we're gonna be wrapping this thing up. Uh, we got I. God, goddamn, Eruption Junior or full size? 
<laughs> it's it's not the eruption junior it's the full size i'm glad that that was a bait <laughs> i was afraid to google what that word was <laughs> i was uh, waiting for you to like see where you yeah. were going with it because i'm like yeah. he's gonna take this the dirty way i know it <laughs> uh, I, I mean i said something and it made it sound like a jihad i think it was bang but for some reason when i read it upside down i said baku <laughs> um but of course that's what trends on social media not not the information but oh well uh let's see we did that one we did that one uh when are you gonna getting out there thomas um as soon as i well i'm poor uh so as soon as i get a, a kayak with a torpedo i'll be doing that what i've learned real quick is my calves are not i'm not lance armstrong i'm not pedaling all over the damn place i gotta get a torpedo let's, so let's, let's see for that. let's see the calf. my, my calves yeah. I, sadly i don't think they'll pay me and actually if you will pay me never mind i'm gonna take that back you will see my calves okay. bradley german do you do there we go. <laughs> Maybe have to wax. I'm more of a wax boy, but do you do, and plus I'm in a standing desk, so it'd be really hard for me to get up that high. Do you do any finesse fishing? I know you like power fishing. Yeah. Oh, really? What? <laughs> um, so, so, oh God, I do finesse fish when I absolutely have to. Like if I'm in a tournament and I need to, and I need to catch my fifth fish, I will I'll break out a Ned rig or hell. I think 2020 was 2020 the year I won angler of the year. Yeah. That year I won a tournament and every fish that I caught was on a drop shot. And I was so like, you, one year you did like, <laughs> no, I hated it. It was the worst day of fishing I've ever had in my life. And I can, I caught fish all day long and I just, I felt stupid at the end of the day. I'm like, this is dumb. Like I should turn in all my stuff. I hate finesse fishing. Um, but in the winter time, I'm forced to, so I do do it in the winter time. And that's when I catch the least amount of fish that I catch all year long. So, hmm. but everybody else catches the least amount of fish in the winter time too. So it's okay. Y'all know where I stand with that question. So I don't need to even rehearse all that stuff about power and finesse. Uh, I mean, this was not one on a Ned rig. It just wasn't. This was I not mean- all that shit was so it depends on who i know i had one power this fishing. wasn't one power fishing one not on a ned rig no not on a ned rig like none of that's on a ned rig did you have that sitting around just ready to go for that one? <laughs> I, I i lined up props i literally lined up props for this just because i mean some might see it as arrogance but i'm just joking uh, it's not my true personality to brag so no, but power fit, and this is the thing. I think I think with the BFS stuff, ninety percent of the big smalls I caught on a Ned rig, I'm fishing sixteen pound fluorocarbon with a medium light extra fast bait caster setup because I, I can deliver that small size thing, but I can hit them with some stuff. And that's the same thing with Christy snapping a tube. Like I think now that they have rods that allow you to do that, I think you're going to see more of a finesse approach with bait caster stuff in the future. Maybe so. Um, there's a question that you really need to get to because. Brad Roach, Where, Brad, Brad Roach just asked a really good one. Oh, let's see. What bait do you throw when grass is floating? Ho, 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 ho. Yeah. Oh. So, um, summertime. Oh, that's great. So, uh, summertime and and even into the fall, it's it's going to be this. It's going to be that seven inch Turk shad. Um, you know, rigged up weedless on a Texas rig, like style hook there. You know, that's, that's the jam that I like to throw, um, uh, whenever it's, when it's really weedy. Um, but this is a clear water thing. It's not, it's not a, you know, it's, it's not something that you're going to use a lot in dirtier water. Um, that's my option for, you know, whenever it's, when it's really bad, cause you can work that bait quick enough through the grass and not get hung up. Um, you know, this in the fall, like this will work. But if, you know, honestly, like if it's dirty or even remotely stained and there's a bunch of floating grass, I shorten up that leader a lot on the fluorocarbon and I put a jackhammer on there and I like to use probably half ounce or more, sometimes three quarter ounce. And I, when I rip it, I rip it. Like I absolutely rip it because it just blows that grass off of there most of the time. Like when I, when I rip it, I'm, I'm trying to throw my shoulder out of the socket whenever I rip that thing. Cause I'm trying and, to. And this is back up to that was Brad Roach. Again, Brad, you just want a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle message me, Instagram, Facebook, you know, the deal, uh, weightless or not weightless. 
um, wait list, depending on current, like if, it, if there's a, if there's a lot of current, um, I'll throw it on one of those Z man hooks that has like the keel weight on there. Um, because it'll help it, you know, work it a little bit to keep it in the water column where I need to keep it. But, you know, it allows me to get it. And, out then, and we have another one where it says, like Matthew said, like Ned, Ned rig hangs up in Susquehanna. Um, no. go look at my BFS Ned rig technique. I got a Japanese ball head jig. It's a finesse ball head jig, and I use that with my Ned rigs, and I don't have the issue because Ned rig hooks suck. They're yeah, just mo- of most jet. of your so most of your exposed Ned rig hooks are gonna suck really bad. Yeah, um, because you really have to keep connection with your bait and, to keep them from getting snagged up. And I don't know about your hook that you were talking about that you use, but for me, the owner blockhead EWG is. I mean, it's worth its weight in gold like that. That owner blockhead EWG hook mm. Ned rig hook is just amazing. And it does not get hung up. I, I mean, it will. I shouldn't say it doesn't get hung up. It'll get hung up, but not to the same, you know, number of times that you will with an exposed Ned rig hook. I'm looking and that's that. honestly anymore. I don't have any other Ned rig hooks other than that owner blockhead EWG. That's the only Ned rig, ho- Ned rig hooks I throw. That's actually a really, I like that one. Let me try you and get try that. It. Yeah. You should try it. Hmm. I'll add that it's, one to my list. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Guys, I'll Jake, break. You think Jake's bait and tackle has them? I, Jake's has them. I'm trying to get them to follow my special hook because I have to get my shit from Japan. And I, do I even have one? I got like half my shit. Actually, holy crap. That's the shock. So uh, it literally is. It's a finesse jig, like for a jig. And it's got, and this is why I go with like 14 pound fluorocarbon with a, a light bait caster because I can hit them. But because of that weed guard in the wintertime, guys, if you feel something, just set the hook because you don't have to worry about breaking because you got heavier stuff. So especially in the Shenandoah and the upper Potomac, they get in the log jams and stuff. Mm-hmm. And when you use that lighter Ned rig crap, you just snag so much and you break and going at that a little bit heavier stuff with that lighter bait though, you can still have the Ned rig presentation, but you know, when in doubt, you can just, you can hit them. Right. I know a guy, a, a guy who guides up here on blue marsh Lake that does something similar to that. He likes an exposed hook, but he uses a real heavy gauge hook, like hook wire. Mm-hmm. And he throws it on a bait caster. Um, and he fishes it out like 20, 30 feet of water. And he, dude, he, he rocks them on that, on that, like heavier gauge Ned Ned hook. He likes it exposed, but he throws it on a bait caster. And I mean, we're talking like 18 pound fluorocarbon. And he's just, what? it's crazy. I think it's just the size more than anything else. I don't know how much of it with these, these Ned rigs and tiny tubes. It's the line. Like, are they line shy or they just want, are they bait shy where they want that smaller presentation? I've always gone back and forth on that when the Ned rig bite is hot, at least where I'm at. I think the, I think the Ned rig bite gets hot whenever they're eating the smaller forage. I think it's the size of the bait. Um, I mean, maybe yeah. in maybe in like crystal clear, gin clear water, like they might get line shy, but you know, I don't think they're line shy as much as they're just very specific on what size. What, what are the fish like? I mean, guys, this will be closing thoughts here. I want to wrap it up because we all we all got things to do. Where is the river going right now? Up, like it's the river. I mean progressively throughout this summer the the limits have continued to get better and better and better and better um last year you know 90 92 to 94 inches would win a tournament um you know comparatively for bass boat that's somewhere between 17 and 21 pounds um you know that would win a tournament this year if you don't have 95 inches don't don't expect to to win um, to cash checks, you probably need 90, 90 plus inches nowadays. Um, but the, the fish, and it's mostly because we haven't had a lot. We haven't had any big floods. Mm-hmm. We have not had any big floods in, mo- in the recent years. And the spawns have been pretty good too. So, and that's, that's not just for smallmouth, but that's spawns for bait fish. So the forage is up, the, you know, the, the river has been, fairly healthy in terms of condition for the smallmouth and even though they have a lot of you know the the invasive species and stuff that are threatening them they're adapting and they're overcoming it and they're just changing some of the things that they do but the river has progressively gotten better over the past couple years 2018 was tough 2019 
well, 2018 wasn't tough. You could catch anything you wanted in 2018 because they were all jacked up on the bank because it was flooded the entire year. 2019 was tough because those fish, I think there was a, there was a big fish kill in some areas of the river, but now, you know, like Middletown, for instance, Middletown to, to Harrisburg, 2019, 2020, you weren't catching a lot of big fish. That stretch now is like 20, 21s, 22s. Like there's big fish down there because we've had relatively, you know, nice, nice water conditions for them. So, wow. Yeah. The best we can hope for is mild winters and no flood conditions. Mild winters and no flood conditions means big smallmouth. Jake, I mean, you're, thank you so much for coming on for so, for, for as long as you did on a Monday night and, and congrats on everything that you've done so far. Do you have another big tournament and what can we plug for you? What do you got coming up? Man, the only thing I got going right now, um, so I, I did qualify for the Bassmaster Classic, but that's not until next March, the kayak series of it. Um, but I have at the end of this month, I have a tournament of champions for the mid-Atlantic kayak bass fishing on the upper Chesapeake Bay. It's a two day tournament. I am three points behind for angler of the year. So I'm hoping to go down there and I mean, if you ain't first or last, right? That's what you gotta do. Just go for it. I'm going down there to try to win that, but that'll be October 28th and 29th. That's freaking awesome, dude. And, I worked and, out a drug deal, worked out a drug deal with work just to get off for that. So, Hey, you got to do what you got to do. You sell what you got to sell. You pimp out your wife if you have to. I get it. I've been well, there. It was either, it was either work was going to let me take leave and get off for it. Or I was going to go down the street and ask my neighbor to write me a note because she's a PA. <laughs> so like, I need a doctor's note for this weekend. Congrats and good luck. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely, <laughs> dude. Um, and then you got a YouTube channel. You got a TikTok. Where can so, people follow um, The YouTube channel is just my name, Jake Harshman. And honestly, I think that might be what it is on TikTok too. Um, Instagram, it's pa.kayakbassin. And um, man, I think the, the only other thing I'd want to promote is this new this new innovative sportsman, Osprey. Um, that boat has really, really done a lot for me this year. So i um, really happy with it. I, I want to see that blow up. I got to get him on the show too. I yes, you do. That. Yes, you do. Trey Leach from Innovative Sportsman. Trey, if you're listening, call me, please, if I don't call you first. <laughs> Brad Roach wants me to give the address of my glory hole. <laughs> Wait, is it for you, Brad? Do you want his glory hole? <laughs> uh, I don't know how to respond to that. There's, uh, a, there's a truck stop on 22. Um, <laughs> this is how he afford his, uh, his spinnerbaits. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly how I got those. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, as always, I got about 10 winners here. Uh, I'll be getting those gift cards out to you over the next 48 hours. So just bear with me since I do this all myself. Uh, again, live will be coming back next Monday at 6 p.m., 7 p.m., where I'll be giving away more crap. If you'd like to join me on Patreon, we're trying to work towards our goal of creating a nonprofit to help actually really help these fisheries out. So you could really just really help the community by going over there uh i feel like i just missed something with the old oh yeah i did my whole speech uh, okay uh the old glory hole is in <laughs> duncan <laughs> oh my goodness good I mean, luck jake not necessary uh, oh, well. i almost said something to get your podcast shut down there for a uh, second. oh well you know what it had a good run it really did <laughs> Guys, like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're you're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.